مساء الخير. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the 32nd round of the Cairo Climate Talks. And today we will be discussing sustainable education, greening the campus and greening the brains, thinking green on the campus. Before we get into the topic, I just have technical announcements for you. Uh, would you please put your mobiles on silent and the session will run in English in case you would love Arabic translation, it's available. You can pick, you can pick it up, the translators from out there, there's instant translation. My name is Maryam Alem. I am an Egyptian climate change advocate and activist, and I will be moderating this evening. First of all, let me just recall briefly what Cairo Climate Talks is. It's actually a platform for cooperation and exchange on topics relevant to climate change. It was established by the German Embassy together with its partners, the Ministry of State for Environmental Affairs and the German Cooperation Agency, which is the GIZ, and definitely more partners. So now we are honored to have Her Excellency, Dr. Mona Ayoub, the Deputy Director of the JAAD Office, His Excellency, Ambassador Julius Loy, welcome to Egypt, sir, and Dr. Mohamed Salah, the first assistant to the Minister of Environment. Today we will be discussing sustainable education and sustainability in the education system and on the campus. Uh, as we may know, Egypt is one, uh, it has one of the leading um, higher education systems across the Arab world and the Middle East. And as we may know that education is central to inspiring, informing and enabling people and nations to improve their quality of life without compromising the future generations, and that's where sustainability comes in. And higher education have key role to play in rebalancing social inequalities and identifying and promoting inclusive, sustainable solutions to allow all the members of society to access and, benefit the, and make the benefits of the globalizing world, especially in Egypt, after all the current happenings and the revolution Higher education has to play a very important role in the social, economic, and environmental transformation. And for now, we are honored to have Dr. Muna Ayoub give an opening remark. Dr. Muna is the Deputy Director of the DAD Office. You may now have the floor. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. It gives me a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, uh, 32nd panel discussion of the Cairo Climate Talk series. Actually, I'm here just to uh, welcome you on behalf of Dr. Roman Lukshaita, who had uh, suddenly uh, a sickness and could not be able to welcome you himself. Uh, so please excuse him for not being able to do that uh, in person. Um, in fact, we are very, very proud to have the new German ambassador among us today. Warm greetings to you, uh, sir, and uh, warm welcome to Egypt. A special wel welcome is also conveyed on behalf of Dr. Roman Lukshaita to our honorable guests, uh, Dr. Mohammed Saleh, the first assistant to the Minister of Environment, uh, as well as the respectable panelists will be, which, who will be introduced by my colleague, the moderator of this event. Um, in fact, Green Campus is a topic which is gaining more and more significance in both countries, be it Germany or Egypt. There are numerous initiatives which uh, ought to be covered. First, in order to be able to choose uh, best practices among them, especially for today, topic uh, sustainable education, thinking green on campus as a connection between the climate issues and the higher education issues. This is important for us as DAD especially as we are a funding agency, the issue of sustainability of higher education with regards to curricular development, with regards to the uh, process of um, setting up new uh, programs, for instance, is of utmost importance. <coughs> Environmental issues have to be taken into account in order to educate students for the challenges that lie ahead of us. It is vital to acknowledge that the ideas and initiatives come from different directions. The students, for example, can have a very uh, substantial contribution in this regard. Luckily, we have two initiatives to present 
that uh, they can tell us about their vision and the work they are, they are already doing. With regards to the energy-related uh, yearly topic of the German Science Center, on which campus we are all in, uh, on today, um, the, um, the, 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 talk, the talk of today uh, is really fitting perfectly to the work done or conducted by the German Science Center. The German Science Center is uh, glad to provide a platform, so to say, for debates contributing to exchange of ideas between Egyptian and German scientists and also uh, the nation at a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, warm welcome to you all in the renovated premises of the German Science Center. We have been away for six months now. The uh, climate, uh, Cairo Climate Talk have been hosted in other venues throughout the last six months because of the renovations. Now it's back to its origin, so to say. We're looking forward for a lively discussion and a pleasant evening with all of you, of course. And let me pass again to the moderator of this evening. Thank you very much and welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Mona, for your opening remarks, and thank you for hosting us here at the Diadi premises. And now I, would, I have the honor to give the floor to Dr. Mohammed Salah, the first assistant to the Minister of Environment. Thank you. Your Excellences, Mr. Julius George Lay, Ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany in Cairo, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. On behalf of His Excellency Dr. Khalid Fahmi, Minister of Environment, I am honored to have the opportunity to address such a distinguished audience here. We are gathered here today to expand learning opportunities because we believe that the education is the key for a better uh, future. I don't need to tell you that the global community today faces a set of challenges. Some of these are relatively new issues such as climate change, energy problems, access to clean water, and the threat to biodiversity. While others, such as poverty, ill health, the need to protect human rights, and promoting equality among people, have been the subject of fierce debate and efforts for many years. Experience has taught us that discussing each of these issues individually does not bring about long-term improvements. Similarly, up the problem and not the source of the challenges we face is not a sustainable solution. We will not achieve sustainable development only with technological solutions, regulatory frameworks, and financial instruments. In addition of those, we need to think green. Ladies and gentlemen, our vision is ambitious but clear. Every human being without discrimination should benefit from an education that fosters the values, competences, knowledge, and the skills to shape a future in line with the demands of sustainable development. This, mean, this means integrating themes relevant to sustainable development, such as climate change, biodiversity, and disaster risk reduction, into education plan and curricula. It also means organizing teaching and learning in a way that promotes students to think green. In this way, students will develop the skills necessary for true sustainability skills, such as the ability to understand the complexity, think in an extraordinary way, or thinking out of the box. Participate in the decision-making process, process and cooperate with others. Ladies and gentlemen, higher education institution train individuals to become highly skilled in areas of vital importance to social, cult cultural, economic, and environmental development. They foster responsible citizenship. They carry out highly regarded research and develop innovations. Within the education system as a whole, they often train teachers for primary, secondary, and even non-formal education and design curricula that trend the leaders of tomorrow. The principles of sustainability have become increasingly influential in the education community in recent years. <coughs> Universities should adopt sustainable development as a key part of their mandate, not only because of the responsibility 
they bear toward wi wider society, but also because being sustainable in outlook makes more attractive to students and the communities in which they are located. They also must identify the importance of sustainable development principles in enhancing the quality of education and improving student motivation. We all agree that it is very important for the decision makers of the future to prepare them with values, skills, and knowledge to promote sustainable development. This means integrating the concept of sustainable development into all subjects. It may also be valuable to require under, undergraduate students to take a course on sustainable development as part of their overall study package, regardless of their area of focus. In this context, I urge higher education in institutions to consider what are the concrete actions we have to follow in our universities and education system to translate the principles of sustainability into clearly defined actions. Once again, let me take this opportunity to thank you all for having organized such an important panel discussion, and I look forward to hearing your ideas. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mohammed, for your insightful opening remark. And now I have the honor to welcome Your Excellency, Ambassador Julius Loy, the ambassador of the German in Egypt. Thank you very much. Indeed, I'm rather newcomer uh, to Cairo two and a half weeks ago. I arrived uh, here and I'm really happy to be invited already on the greening grounds of the uh, Scientific Center for the Cairo Climate Talks. Um, it's an issue which I followed even the Foreign Service uh, for quite some time. And uh, therefore, Mrs. Uh, Mona Ayub, Deputy Director of the DRD in the Cairo office, thank you for your warm words of welcome uh, directed at me. Dr. Mohamed Salah, first assistant uh, to the Minister of Environment, thank you for your very uh, cooperative uh, introductory uh, remarks, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear Cairo climate talkers. It's a pleasure for me to open the 32nd round of the Cairo climate talks after a long summer break. As you might be aware, this also, as I just mentioned, it is my first session of Cairo climate talks in my new function as ambassador of the Federal Republic of Germany in Egypt. Having once worked as a Foreign Office Commissioner for Environmental and Biopolitical Issues, I'm thrilled to hear more about climate topics from an Egyptian perspective. Furthermore, during my last posting as German Ambassador to the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, France, climate issues appeared on my bilateral agenda again. The upcoming and hopefully groundbreaking climate summit in Paris end of this year has been a main focus of French-German bilateral relations in the run-up to this event. In this respect, I see Cairo Climate Talks as an excellent opportunity to raise awareness for environmental issues amongst different strata of society and to bring together experts from both Egypt and Germany as well as from different professional fields. Climate change is one of the most pressing, and you mentioned already, transversal challenges the globe societies have to tackle in common efforts. I emphasize the word societies, since the effort of governments or industry alone will not suffice. Each individual contribution will make a difference, and much attention in this respect should be given to our future generations. Therefore, Education will have to play a pivotal role in our collective efforts if we really want to assure their sustainability. Egypt has a massive potential in this regard, given that more than half of its population is aged below 24 years. And quite a few of them are here uh, this evening. 
Furthermore, this country hosts some of the largest, oldest and most renowned universities in the Arab region. In my view, universities and other institutes of education serve as role models. They have the essential task to educate our next generations. They function as societal workshops for the future, as pioneers for sustainability. Students are multipliers for green thinking within their families and their broader social and professional context. I'm convinced that independent of their field of study, students of all disciplines should be enabled to make sustainable decisions in a more and more complex world. Ladies and gentlemen, we are now at the crossroads. The UN decade Education for Sustainable Development has come to an end and is now followed by a World Action Plan with the primary objectives to first integrate sustainability into international and national education policies. Second, to promote whole institution approaches. Third, to strengthen the capacity of educators, trainers and other change agents. Fourth, to support youth in their role as change agents for sustainable development. And finally, fifth, to accelerate the search for sustainable development solutions at the local level. I hope that this, during this evening we will be able to identify approaches of how to translate this agenda into the Egyptian as well as the German context, or maybe even both at the same time. Let me illustrate the latter by mentioning one powerful tool for making education more sustainable, bicultural master programs. Typically, these Egyptian German programs are highly innovative in methods and interdisciplinary in teaching. Two examples for such programs are renewable energies in the MENA region, a cooperation between the universities of Cairo and Kassel, and integrated urbanism and sustainable design a project of Ein Shams and University of Stuttgart. Not only the content of these programs itself is related to sustainability. Also, designing such programs requires close collaboration between project partners on all levels of your university and intense exchanges when it comes to designing curricula. Thinking outside the box, this was mentioned already, and being confronted with international partners in an intercultural context can also be impulse and stimulus for developing sustainable energy structures at universities. I will now leave the rest of our experts on the panel and I wish you a fruitful discussion and a sustainable educating journey through this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, and we are very honored to have you here. Uh, thank you for these substantial welcoming notes. I hope we'll be able to discuss some of the input that you have actually just gave us. Um, for now, I would like to invite my esteemed panelists to come on the podium here to join the panel. Esteemed panelists, would you please come over? <laughs> okay, Julius. <coughs> Thank you for being here. And now, before we dive into the topic, let me introduce our four panelists. And starting with the ladies, we have Professor Dr. Rosh Alkhouli, who is the Dean of Engineering at Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development. Dr. Raja has 20 years of experience in working in the field of sustainable development, resource management, and environmental protection. Dr. Raja has managed many, many foreign-funded research projects, as well as local programs in the fields of water quality monitoring, modeling and assessment, geographic information systems, remote sensing, waste treatment, and gender mainstreaming. She has more than 10 years of experience of developing specialized postgraduate training programs in project design and management. She also serves 
as a short-term consultant for the UN, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization, and she's very highly involved in international organizations. Eventually, she has published several scientific and technical papers in national and international scientific journals and periodicals, in addition to chapters in international books. You have a very impressive background, Dr. Rasha, and we are very honored to have you here, and this is so much empowerment. Moving on to Professor Dr. Mohamed Salhin. He's not here, unfortunately. He wasn't able to make it, but he's coming shortly. And from the student perspective, we have Abdurrahman Al Gamel from Egypt, who is um, a project manager of Youth in Green Egypt. It's a German nonprofit organization with young people around the world to come up with innovative and practical solutions to global challenges, such as environmental, sorry, such as environmental pollution, social injustice, and overconsumption of natural resources. The Egypt division of the group hosts <clears throat> host university students who create renewable energy projects during a national sustainability summer school that has been sponsored by Cairo Climate Talks. Abdurrahman is a senior student who is completing his final year at Cairo University and is set to graduate in 2016. And from Germany, we have Johannes Geibel, the founder of Germany's Greening the University, is actually the co-founder, as you have told me before, it's an initiative which began at the University of Tübingen to incorporate sustainable thinking into campus life and to converse the university, to convince the university to cut back on its use of natural resources, use recycled materials, and take other measures to reduce its environmental footprint. The initiative has actually spread throughout the country to other universities, and he's also a board member of the network, which actually incorporates universities and it's actually a vertical network that allows initiatives and people to work together to create a more sustainable university landscape. Johannes holds a bachelor degree in international economics and European studies from the University of Tübingen and a master's in public economics from the Free University of Berlin. Thank you for making it all the way from Germany to Egypt. We are very honored to have you here. And now we are waiting for our fourth panelist. However, we will have to start. Um, let me give you a slight remark. It's a technical remark, actually. Um, the discussion is going to go in rounds. Uh, in case you have any questions, inside that folder there is a piece of paper which you can use to ask your questions. You can write it down here, and then my colleagues will come and pick it. Uh, we kindly call upon you to keep the questions short and precise, and if you want to make statements or discussions, that can be during the dinner buffet. And we gladly have our fourth panelist. Right on time, thank you, sir. Okay, so now I can introduce our esteemed fourth panelist, Professor Dr. Mohammed Salhin, who is a professor in integrated planning and design at the Faculty of Engineering, Ain Shams University. He obtained his PhD in urban design from Edinburgh College of Art. He initiated and coordinated and managed several international cooperation projects with the universities in Germany, Sweden, Austria, and Denmark. He's currently the chairperson of the committee of EU here, Egypt, which is a higher education reform experts committee. He has contributed to various workshops and seminars on internationalization and harmonization of higher education in Egypt and the EU, as well as neighboring countries. He is the co-founder and director of the DAAD funded bicultural master program of integrated urbanism and sustainable design at Aim Shams University and currently the advisor of the Minister of Scientific Research for Integrated Development. Thank you for making it here, sir. So unfortunately, um, Dr. Roman Lukchaita, who is the director of the DAAD Cairo office, and Professor Ashraf Hatim, Secretary General of the Supreme Council of Universities, were not able to join us here. And now, um, we are just about to start. Uh, I would like to brief my panelists on how we go. It's rounds of questions where each person gets a question and it will be followed by a public discussion.
Welcome on board. And uh, for this round of questions, I would like to start my first question with the lady, Dr. Rasha. Dr. Rasha, Heliopolis University is actually one of a kind. It constitutes one model of private universities that we can say has started from scratch in Egypt. So how different is Heliopolis University? What vision did you have for sustainable development that you could not find in the existing higher education system that you wanted to offer? So uh, welcome everybody. Um, uh, Heliopolis University is really a different model because it adapts sustainable development as the one um, main theme of all the faculties within the university. So uh, setting the curricula, the courses, that everything started back uh, in the early 90s when there was Heliopolis Academy. And Heliopolis Academy was a re research institution mainly into uh, renewables and their relevance to uh, the environment uh, and the sustainability. And, and it started developing till 2009 when the idea was so clear that um, we invest uh, as a big organization in the primary schools, secondary schools, and preparatory schools. Uh, and we need to go further uh, in an initiative for higher education. And since 2009 to 2012, the struggles were going to have the approval of the higher Supreme Council to have uh, uh, a nonprofit university called Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development, and at the beginning it was called Seacom University for Sustainable Development, but it was kind of affiliated to the Seacom group because they both have one founder, but later it was uh, approved as Heliopolis University for Sustainable Development. So the one big vision and theme of Heliopolis University is sustainable development, not only through induction to the curricula, uh, and, and, and the programs within the faculties, but also to the process of the self-consciousness and development of students, staff, and employees to act as um, a community that is developed and oriented a way to um, um, develop and, 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 and spread the concept of sustainable development. So um, yesterday, maybe we had time to, to show how different Teleopolis University is, how um, uh, implemented research and programs are. So for example, I come from the School of Engineering where our programs are renewable energy, water engineering focusing on unconventional water resources, um, green architecture focusing on um, uh, green uh, urban design and eco-friendly materials and uh, mechatronics and robotics for the use of the uh, uh, automation within a, a simple economic and mo uh, modern way. So these are quite different and, 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 and it goes and extends to uh, the faculty of business adapting the green economy as its main theme and entrepreneurship uh, uh, and, and startups and also the faculty of pharmacy depending on herbal medicines and products that are rather natural and, and organic, not uh, chemical. Uh, and and, and to m in the coming years we'll be expanding with organic um, um, agriculture and, and biotechnology uh, with fine arts and, and many other fields that fit within the big holistic uh, theme of uh, sustainable development. So um, briefly, each and every course in our curricula is directed to sustainable development one way or another. And these courses are visited yearly, whether uh, in, in, in nationally or internationally with experts to add the dimension uh, of the development, whether environmental or technological or whatever. 
And uh, we see uh, our strength is that we believe in sustainable development and we implement within our campus many uh, projects for greening the campus, recycling our waste, uh, solid waste, uh, water waste, uh, using uh, uh, photovoltaic sun collectors, semi-transparent panels, uh, desalinating the water, aquaponics, all these, even though we are just our third year, but we are running these projects within the campus and extending our projects to uh, closer areas like uh, our campaigns and our implementations like in areas, in remote areas like uh, in Wahat, Adliya and, and many different uh, uh, places. And now we are starting a new project with um, the Ministry of Water Resources and Irrigation for the implementation of solar pumping uh, for small uh, uh, landholders in uh, Sharae. So it's, it's, it's we, we are expanding in any sort that we can um, offer our help and, and, and expertise where possible and get our students exposed as much as we can. And I, as I speak now, I left my students back in the campus uh, installing uh, our new panels. Uh, and, and, and the others are uh, in Wahad trying to fix the bus because the bus w <laughs> stopped somewhere and they don't have signals, so hopefully they'll be back. But this is the type of life that, that we live in Heliopolis University. And, and to, uh, to add to His Excellency, within, within respect to uh, postgraduate studies, there is the, the GIE projects, which, which is the Green Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program, which is uh, uh, postgraduate program for sustainable development masters. So many public universities call it the, the green innovation and entrepreneurship, like Zegazig uh, uh, and, and uh, Alexandria, and others call it the sustainable development masters uh, for multidisciplinary purpose, like Heliopolis University and American University. So it's a master for sustainable development with multidisciplinary. We'll all sit together and, and, and see from all aspects how we can develop and how it could be sustainable. And I believe it's one of the very uh, promising uh, programs uh, directed to um, sustainable development. I, I guess I was too long, so I leave the floor to my colleagues. And, and, and maybe uh, if we have, uh, you have time, just serve uh, the internet for Heliopolis University for sustainable development. And, uh, and like I extended my invitation yesterday, I'd love to see any of the students, guests, researchers, whoever is interested, welcomed. And, and we offer even for students uh, to join our internship programs whenever they like and we'll host them. And, um, and, and it's an open invitation for any sort of cooperation within the context of uh, sustainable development. Thank you so much, Dr. Rasha, for this introduction into Heliopolis University, what it does and how you work. And now moving on from a private university to a public university perspective, I would like to ask Dr. Sarheen, based on the existing higher education state in Egypt, how sustainable do you think it is? And is there a pressing need for a shift towards sustainable education in the higher education system? First of all, I would like to apologize for my late arrival due to uh, Master C's defense that we had uh, over the last two days. Just finished the last one and just rushed and the traffic was not in my favor, so sorry for that. Um, well, your question is kind of ironic. You're talking about teaching sustainability and sustainable education in itself because uh, I remember maybe three, three years ago, we were here in the same room and we were talking about um, I um, can't remember at that time, was it Cairo Climate Talks or Cairo Trans Transplantation Talks? It was one of the talks. Uh, and we were talking about uh, how we see Egypt in post-revolution time and uh, what kind of changes are we looking for and what kind of immediate actions that can be taken. Uh, and at that time, um, I, I still remember my comment because I think we, still the slogan that we're going after, Egypt does not require a minor change, it requires a structural change. And one of that is how to ensure the sustainability of the actions, the good actions and the good deeds that we're trying to introduce into society. It's not only introducing a new module and a new program, but how to make sure that this program 
is continuing in itself, is sustaining itself, is not only that, but also penetrating where it should be penetrating and, where, and reaching where it should be reaching. Um, um, I would say that the intentions are there. I mean, within the system, the intentions to sustain and to change and to move towards um, a more um, reliable, more um, um, relevant type of education to the Egyptian context is there. You just have to take these intentions to the level of practicality and level of implementation. What kind of procedures, what kind of uh, installations are there within the landscape of higher education that would help that to take place? Um, I would give an example. Uh, when we uh, initiated uh, our program, there was already, um, I think, two other programs installed, Remena uh, and Enema, um, two programs installed between Germany and Egypt. And uh, all of these programs, they were meant to be for um, um, interdisciplinary approach. It should allow uh, students from different approaches to join from different backgrounds and to still get their degree and continue. And of course, that was something completely new for um, the higher education system in Egypt. Um, uh, one thing else, um, the Egyptian system of education requires that uh, in order for you to register for an MSc, for example, in any university, that you should have a, a PSc, equivalent to the degree being offered by the uh, Egyptian system. And I can't just count the how many problems we faced just to get that running. And with some persistence, with some lobbying, with some convincing, we managed to get degrees um, uh, accredited in Egypt, recognized that allow students from the different backgrounds to join and to graduate and to continue for their PhD. And those who are in education would know how difficult that would be uh, um, within the education system. We also um, made it possible that students who would apply for our programs would not need to go to the Supreme Council of University to apply for equivalence of their bachelor degree if they're coming from Canada or even from T. Berlin. They would have to apply for equivalence, by the way, if they're getting a PSC from T. Berlin or Harvard. Even from Harvard, they have to apply for equivalence. Uh, that's the system. And um, um, it was a kind of a structural change that at the Supreme Council, we communicated, we talked, and we convinced them that Students are here to get education, and for education, you leave the education uh, institute to really evaluate the type of the candidate uh, that's suitable for the type of education that they're offering, and at the end, there is a market for that. Either the student will join or not join. Either the student will graduate and get a job or get, or get unemployed. And that's the dy natural dynamics, and I think one of the major changes that followed from that, from two years maybe, or three years of discussions and dialogues and pressure from here and there with the Supreme Council um, is um, I personally was introduced into something called um, the Permanent Engineering Supreme Council Committee, something like that. I mean, uh, it's uh, the committee in charge of reviewing all degrees, all institutions, anything that deals with engineering education. Usually, the youngest member of that committee would be 60. Um, and I think the introduction, I, and it, I was told that you are introduced in order to bring in the new blood. Um, it's not because I'm unique, but I'm just representative of a group. And in that we're trying really, to, so there is an intention to change. Uh, we're trying to change from within, and there are intentions. It's just how to communicate the change. Um, part of the uh, making the, your education sustainable is to get the society to appreciate the type of education that you're offering and to, add, to come to you asking to cooperate so it's not the other way around. In our uh, first intake, we uh, collaborated with GIZ because they were our partners from the application. So we were not yet having grounds in, on the Asian landscape. In the second round, we were on exile in Tunis because of the situation in Egypt. So we had our partners with UN Habitat uh, last year, we had the Ministry of Renewable, uh, Renewable uh, what? No, uh, Urban Renewal, sorry. The name is quite confusing and they might cancel it even within these two days. Um, <laughs> so um, that was a, a national central agency partner that actually asked for our support and our partnership with them so that we can make a change from within. This year, we're partnering with the Ministry of Housing and the Ministry of Planning. 
uh, that I think only by doing that you can sustain your education by positioning it properly within the landscape you create the demand for your education only by creating the demand and by showing that what you're offering is actually of value to the society you are um, ensuring sustainability otherwise it's just an academic exercise uh, with maybe two or three interested academic partners doing it together for two or three years and then it's gone and only by embedding it institutionally you ensure sustainability it takes time it takes energy it takes stamina um, uh, you will get high blood pressure you will get all kinds of diseases to get that through but at the end it it really pays back when you see a structure change change happening and only by doing that you get things sustainable not by maybe a good project uh, but only sustainable institutional structure reform Um, thank you for your answer and what I actually understand from what you are answering that we need an incremental change which is also participatory where we get the community address its needs and harvest the fruits that respond to what it needs and moving on to the student perspective and our guest from Germany I would like to ask Johannes Johannes you are the co-founder of greening the university initiative which is actually now a very well established one on a university level I would like to ask you, what was your starting point? How did you evolve? When did you realize that, okay, we in German universities, we need to incorporate the sustainable education and sustainable thinking on campus? I would love to hear that from you. Well, uh, what I would say, first of all, I think there is for a long time uh, a perception in Germany that um, when it comes to sustainability, um, we are much more ahead in a lot of policy fields um, compared to the education field. Um, many international uh, guests are asking, well, when it comes to energy supply, for example, Germany is much ahead of uh, many countries in the world. But when it comes to the education system, I would say it's, it's not that leader that it is in the uh, energy field. Um, so I would say there, there's always been a certain awareness under students, well, we have to change the education system and, of course, universities. So how it started with, uh, with greening the university was pretty simple. One of, uh, one of, um, one of, one of, us, of our students, he studied one semester abroad in, in Boston, in the, in the U.S., and at that, at that stage he got familiarized with another student group. Similar, similar name. I'm, I'm not sure if it's also called Greening the University, so whether he just copied the name or so. But there he just got, got the idea, well, why are not we becoming active? Not just, you know, claiming universities should change, but why are not we just start acting? So he came back and gathered other students, me as well. And so we, we, we started this group, started out writing a concept paper. What does sustainability mean for us, for the university? And of course, it doesn't mean just you know, reducing some energy and, you know, separating garbage. Luckily, we don't have to fight for that in Germany because it's in place and as a general system. But of course, when it comes to university, it's about changing the way um, we teach things and the way and, and, the, and the content of, uh, of, of our teaching. And of course, also the way we do research and the topics we do research on. Um, and we, so we as a student uh, group started out by, by tackling the, in these two big things, integrating sustainable development into teaching and research, and also integrating it into the actual daily life of the university. So establishing structure that all, all stakeholders um, at, the, at the university, students, but also professors, academic staff, employees, up to the, up to the president, are, are pretty much then forced to, to deal with sustainability. So one of our first key projects was to convince the university to introduce an environmental management system. Why that? Why not just starting a single project? Why? Well, we thought of what we really want, want to achieve is that even if we as a student groups uh, die out in 10, 10 years or even in five years because our generation of students left the university, um, we should. We w we would like to leave that university at a stage where where we finally were able to to alter the, the structures. 
So we didn't really want to just start little single projects. So we came up with that, with that idea of, of a big structure of an the environmental management scheme. While at, at that stage, our, our chancellor at the university was not not at all convinced of sustainability. Um, but then we said, well, listen, um, you, da you, you don't have to care about all these global issues and the fact that we should act and education is important and all these big points that you also made. But we just said, well, you could just simply save money with, into, with, the, with just establishing management structures and, and by doing so, tackling uh, these, uh, these resource issues. So we, could, we were just able to, con to convince him by, by the money thing. But by getting him by, by just the, the, money, the money trigger, of course then you integrate or you, you implement such a program leading to around 50 people who are regularly dealing with environmental issues through the whole university. You are then of course doing capacity building by such a program. So it's then in not just, in, in not just uh, keeps with this certain management uh, structure, but you know you, you, you broaden uh, things up and you may and, and, you, and sustainability becomes a, a broader issue in whole university structures. So this was, this was the first point that we were very in the, in the first year already able to, to convince um, the university leader to, to establish such a system. And the second big thing was of course for us to, to alter the teaching structure. First, um, we just heard the example here of uh, the Helopolis um, University, which were, I, I think, lucky enough to have the chance to, to build a university fr from the ground, right, to, to, to really start uh, something new. We in Tübingen had the, had the problem that we had to um, change the d director of a, of a big ship, I would say, which perceived itself as being relatively successful. And I would say, if you, com if, if you look at the typical academic figures, the University of Tübingen is a very successful university, you know, in terms of publication, in terms of international connectedness. They, it is a, a successful university, but so how do you can convince them, well, you should probably also think about sustainable development and what that means for university structures. So we started out by, by arguing that we really want to make a sustainable uh, su sustainable development and an issue and topic for every student, not, not just found one single master program, which is, which is also very important. So to have really like the, like the specialist, the sustainability spe uh, specialist, but I think it's also when it comes to awareness, to daily action, it's key that really every student uh, gets familiarized with that concept and not just learns about the concept, but also uh, learns to act according to the concept. Um, so we were lucky to, to have already structures in place, um, structures that were beyond, beyond the, the single faculty. So there were um, like a career service, um, it is called there, that offers courses that were able um, to choose for every bachelor student, basically also for master student, but mainly bachelor students. So we were able then to, to convince the leader of this, um, of this program to also um, to start out like a new, like a new um, um, study program there focusing uh, specifically on sustainable development. So we started out by four courses in, uh, in 2009 and by now it has been really moving into the university structures, offering now 30 courses each semester covering five to 600 students which are really dealing with what are the concepts of sustainable development, what are the, the uh, ethics um, behind these concepts or why are we caring anyway about the next generation? We could also say why we don't have to care. It's, it's us we're living right now, right? So there's an ethical background behind and it's probably also impo important to understand like why are we thinking like this? But it, then we're also having like courses that deal with a specific topics. So what does sustainability means for mobility, for the energy system, for the financial system, uh, for the health system? So we're covering all these, uh, all these uh, broad issues and also the idea is not just, you know, to have theoretical discussions and thinking of theoretical concepts and developing the uh, theoretical concept, but also to make it practical. So we really want to come from, from teaching to learning to acting. So we really want to, uh, to, uh, yeah, to motivate all students, not just say, well, yes, we have to act and I'm not really much more motivated to act, but really to become change agents by themselves by starting out projects after that. So there, there was just like two, two, uh, two examples of, of what we did there. Yes. 
Well, this is actually a very integrated uh, model for change which incorporates the three dimensions of sustainable development. You have mentioned the economic aspect, you have mentioned the social aspect and an environmental aspect. And this is actually very awesome from a student perspective. So now we move all the way from Germany to Egypt. Abdurrahman, so you are the director of the projects of Youth Think Green Egypt. We would really love to know what is Youth Think Green? How did it break through the Egyptian um, university campus? What are you doing? Enlighten us on this. Okay, first uh, I would love to thank you so much uh, for inviting us here today and also I would love to thank the German Embassy for having us here to talk about uh, our initiative. Uh, whenever I talk about Youth in Green, uh, I start by clarifying the name because I'm, I'm pretty much sure that it might be a little bit vague for most of you. Uh, so Youth in Green consists of three words. It's Youth, Think, and Green. And it's not you think green. So I would just wanted to clarify it. Um, I'm, I'm the project manager. I'm not the director of all the projects, just uh, one project. And uh, I'll talk now about Youth Think Green. Uh, it started in 2009 as an NGO based in Berlin uh, with an aim to raise environmental awareness and to promote sustainable development through education. And it, it also has a, a global outreach. So. It doesn't work only in, in, in Germany, but also in more than 15 countries all over the world. And Egypt is actually one of them. And it, it started in 2009 as well. And uh, in, the, in a European school, and actually it's a German school, uh, where they contacted uh, Youth Think Green International over there. And they started the, the activities here uh, in Egypt. And then in 2013, it shifted to Cairo University as a student initiative over there. Uh, and currently it is incubated there uh, right now. Uh, so there we work on three different activities and main activities. And when I talk about th these activities, you will uh, obviously notice the difference between the Egyptian, I'm sorry, the Egyptian uh, initiatives and the German side, uh, because there is a difference in the governance uh, uh, system, or I would say in Germany, it's, it is a lateral governance system, mm -hmm. but in Egypt it is a pyramidal governance system, which puts many layers between decision makers and the students. So our activities might not be directly, uh, I would say, implemented on campus only, but also off campus. Uh, because it, it, it takes a lot of time and to get just a, an approval to do something and stuff like that. So I would start talking about our activities anyways. Um, we have awareness campaigns, we have technical uh, projects, and we also have uh, uh, summer camps where we organize summer camps. So I will talk briefly about each activity, uh, starting by the awareness campaigns. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Salheen might have uh, mentioned that the change needs to be not only on the education level, but also uh, the infrastructure, actually, of, of the, the campus and, and, and not only the, the curriculum. So what we're trying to do is not only uh, organizing awareness campaigns about educating students uh, about, for instance, uh, recycling papers, which we already did, uh, but also we are trying to decrease the gap between the students and the decision makers. And here in this case, we're talking about the, the dean, for instance, and also uh, the minister of, uh, of the environment, Dr. Khaled Fahmi. So uh, we have different campaigns. One of them is uh, having public awareness events, targeting a, a specific topic. Uh, for example, we had uh, uh, an event about sustainable cities. We, have, we had an event about uh, environmental entrepreneurship and most importantly we invite the decision makers in these uh, um, events and also so that there, there will be interaction between uh, them and the students or the audience which basically are students most of them and from one of the events we uh, scheduled a meeting with uh, the minister of the environment in order to discuss how the, the youth will be involved in the in the ministry's uh, plan and how, uh, what, are, what is our role. So, so I, I, I think that the government is working alone and the youth are, uh, is working also alone. So we need to bridge, uh, to, to, like, to link them together. 
So also we have uh, just normal campaigns about uh, teaching the students about different topics. I mentioned already uh, uh, recycling papers. And we have another uh, awareness campaign. Uh, it's called uh, the Tree of Hope, and it's an international campaign. Uh, it's also an attempt to decrease this gap uh, where the students, it, the tree is, is made of discarded materials and uh, the students come and write their hopes and their wishes and their concerns and their ideas and then we invite uh, decision makers also to take a look at, these, at this uh, tree uh, so they can interact uh, together. Moving to the next project, which is the technical uh, projects, or the next activity, which is the technical projects, we are actually working on uh, constructing a solar tree. Uh, a solar tree, uh, it is not a new uh, invention or something. We're trying just to innovate in the designs and stuff like that. So basically, the solar tree is uh, a tree-like structure, metal structure, with the branches of the tree replaced with solar panels. So uh, we are trying to develop it and to uh, implement it or in, in, uh, to put it in, in on university campuses where the, the energy generated from the solar panels are used for uh, charging cell phones, laptops, and providing also Wi-Fi wi for the students on campus. Uh, and we actually participated in different uh, competitions uh, in order to have a grant or something so we can uh, develop the, the project. And we are now having uh, an acceleration program in one of the organizations, and we hopefully uh, n want to be incubated to completely uh, develop it. So I'll move now to the most important activity, in my opinion, which is uh, organizing summer camps. Uh, the idea behind the summer camp is to provide an, an, an environment, an isolated environment from the society where the students come and, and learn, and they start to innovate and, and, and work on projects. And I will talk specifically, through the summer camp, we target or we provide four different things. Uh, we provide uh, technical uh, uh, workshops where uh, we focus on the hands-on experience aspect of the learning process because I believe that in our education system it is not enough for the students. Uh, they do not interact with machines and stuff like that. So we focus on providing technical workshops. We also provide uh, academic lectures uh, about uh, one of the topics like solar energy, or sustainable cities, or um, energy management. We also provide field trips for our students where they go and see a plant where they see how it works and they actually like they live like the, the real and, and the experience, the real, uh, um, what would I say, the, like in reality, they see everything in reality. And the fourth thing, uh, which is the most important thing, we target uh, entrepreneurship. So we provide uh, different workshops about business modeling, uh, finance, marketing and sales. And the idea behind these workshops is actually we don't want our students to just to take knowledge about solar energy or sustainability in general. Uh, and that's it. No, we want them to actually in, in, uh, apply what they have learned in, in the project that they work on. We divide them into different teams and each team has uh, an idea that they work on. And at the end of the summer camp, uh, in our closing ceremony, they start pitching the ideas uh, to different investors uh, where we had uh, a judging committee or a jury uh, to select different teams uh, in order to be incubated in the, in, the, in the organization. Well, we organized only two summer camps uh, so far. The first was last year, and it was actually the first time to do this uh, as students. And it was the first summer school uh, of its type and uh, targeting only uh, uh, sustainability. And the second uh, summer camp was this year. It was last August. And it was in, in Technical University of Berlin, Campus Seguna. And we uh, partnered with them to host the summer camp. We also had different uh, supporters and, and sponsors like the German uh, Embassy and the Cairo Climate Talks uh, last year. And uh, this year, we were supported also by the the Ministry of uh, the Environment. Um, so yeah, wh what, I, what we're trying to do is to create an environment, as I said, for the students where they, it was for three weeks, the camp. And uh, they stayed together for three weeks working on their projects. So it's not just only changing their, uh, or adding some knowledge to their knowledge, but actually it's changing their mindsets. So, and it's, it's sustainability is just not about education and stuff. It's, it's more of a, 
social uh, level and also economical level and, and, and for sure the technical level and we targeted the three of them uh, through our uh, summer camps. So this is briefly what Youth in Green does here in Egypt in, in the three uh, activities. But we, we definitely, the next year, we are going to add more uh, projects and stuff, and we might talk about that, um, just Please to give more time for my colleagues. <laughs> okay, so thank you. This is actually very proactive. And um, now we have concluded the first round of questions. We have been honored to have you, Dr. Mohammed. Thank you so much. Um, and now we start the second round of questions. And I would love to start with a question again to Dr. Rasha. Um, while you were mentioning an overview about Heliopolis University and how it started, you mentioned its affiliation to SICUM. So building on that, uh, how can Heliopolis University give us an example of collaboration uh, with multi-stakeholders, some of them is actually business, and as far as we know, that SECOM is a company. Um, so how, how can universities, you're speaking about a private model, cooperate with businesses in order to um, provide innovative, locally relevant uh, research and teaching methods that respond to the needs of the society and the community? Well, you are right that uh, uh, Heliopolis is somehow affiliated to SICAM, but SICAM is not just a company, it's a, a big organization. Um, uh, yes, it is a business, uh, some business companies like uh, Z, Soil and More, uh, 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 Nature Tax, it's, it's like six or seven companies uh, that are mainly into um, uh, organic food and, uh, and herbs uh, and um, all types of organic products and uh, herbal medicines uh, and, and, and as well as a, a development foundation which is mainly into uh, health and education. So there are SICM schools for primary, secondary and preparatory education also working in sustainable development and the development of uh, students uh, and their families. And, and it's not located in Cairo, it's located in Sharia, so it's, it's on the countryside. And, 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 and kids there learn from the uh, uh, kindergarten how to play the violin and the piano. So they are kind of oriented in a way that putting arts and opening to senses, beauties, and, and, and all different activities uh, that build their characters that are willing to absorb uh, the concept of sustainable development. Uh, so, so normally the, the, the kids learn these arts, languages, humanities, social science, uh, uh, economic dimensions at school time like they do at the uh, university time. So this is part of a mandatory pro holistic program that introduces these as part uh, so I cannot imagine, an, for example, an engineer without listening to music and being innovative and creative. So that's how we see things. That's one, one thing. So Seekim goes into the development of characters and, and the orientation and, and, and discovering ourselves and as well as the self-consciousness because we develop as individuals and then we can convey the development of uh, and, and be part of, uh, as, as said, uh, the um, change agents that can contribute to the community. This is from one side, but the other side is that since these companies are, are into business and have been surviving for almost 40 years now, uh, when time nobody heard about organic food, and now it's very common that you see different types in supermarkets and people talking about healthy food that's not uh, incorporating any of the chemicals, but rather into composite and natural fertilizers. So these companies, these factories that work on that, and, 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 and the big, big network of sister companies, whether in Egypt, Germany, uh, uh, Austria, mainly, mainly in Europe, uh, are, are into a big organization that support uh, the university within the market needs. 
So that's how our programs evolved. It's not driven with what we want. It's driven by what the market that is into sustainable development needs. Mm -hmm. So that's how the program evolved of Heliopolis University. And as well as the practicality, the equipment, the projects, because Heliopolis University hosts 30% of the EU-funded projects in Egypt and the universities. Rather, it's a very, very small, but it has a big history in the implemented research programs. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's a big strength. So it, these companies, um, you know, like give all the support, all the expertise, and support that students from the very first year has to go into one of uh, the companies to uh, interact in a real life style of uh, practicality elsewhere if they if we can find anywhere else but this is mandatory so we have technical experts coming on daily basis we have the students going to the companies on regular basis we have sister companies involved we have business people coming talking to us and 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 we have we are sending our students in any way even to work as farmers if th that's a part of their uh, community service uh, courses they take. Mm -hmm. So w yes, we're lucky because we have a, a mother that can give us endlessly and we have uh, sisters and brothers that can give us support and, 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 it's, and, and whenever we start an initiative we find uh, nowadays a big support in, in many Egyptian uh, universities and agencies that are into sustainable development. So yes, we're, we're proud that we are affiliated to SICA. <laughs> so, uh, can we say that the students actually get graded and get credit based on their community uh, involvement? Yes. It, th they do have on the second year to fulfill a community service program at dependent on the relevance to their program, for example, the water program, whether the energy program. And, and any uh, internship they follow, they have to identify the uh, sustainable development uh, uh, dimension of their program because it has to fit with the, with the concept and their target of work. That doesn't mean they're kind of isolated from what's happening on the communities because um, looking at, at many aspects, we invite companies and, and for example, we, 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 we invite companies that were talking about pains and then we're discussing how friendly to the environment you are and then we discover that they have a new pain that's coming to the market uh, that um, uh, saves uh, uh, the, the use of chemicals and it reduces the temperatures within buildings and reduces the echo and, and stuff like this. So whenever we dig into uh, the corporate world, we find that yes, there is an initiative and it just needs that we need to dig more and to work on it more and to uh, start working on uh, the uh, issues of saving uh, our resources and, 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 and the environment around us. Well, so that's actually um, a kind of curriculum that goes beyond the institutional borders of the Heliopolis University. This is what I understood from the context. Um, beyond the classes, the it goes classes, beyond yes. the buildings. It goes wherever we can 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 yes. can do our our role as really as knowing what it is about. Great, thank you. Um, so now my question to Dr. Musallam, from an expert perspective, um, to what extent have the bicultural <laughs> programs and partnerships on both short term and long term when it comes to sustainability programs and master's programs? that are being implemented in partnerships, to what extent do they actually pave the way to embed these courses and embed these programs that we can actually develop these programs inside our public universities? So in order that when the funding is over or when the partnership is over, we are able to continue and constitute and produce our own research. Um, maybe unlike private universities, we don't have mom or brothers who can support. Uh, on the contrary, maybe the mother and dad, they might need also some support from our side. They might also seek that. And um, um, for sure, I think um, 
the uh, bicultural programs um, were really important in introducing um, that change. Uh, the change of the need to introduce this type of culture of education uh, because the bicultural programs did not only come with uh, um, fund uh, or money that makes it possible, but, but also with some concepts and uh, some values that's coming with it. Uh, values um, or concept that come with it like um, kind of mandating that you have to get interdisciplinary programs running, you have to get them accredited, you have to be able to accept uh, students from background, uh, different backgrounds, you have to make it possible for students from different nationalities to join and to enroll and to continue and to live their life in Cairo and to offer uh, in a state university um, the type of service that an international student would be expecting to get. And uh, I'm not saying that uh, that's in favor of offering a service for international students, but that's actually in favor of the local student. Because by going through that experience, you learn a lot of what you're missing and what you can do very easily to serve the wider uh, masses of students. Uh, by uh, um, enhancing, you, enhancing your guideline, your guidebook, your uh, basic information that an international, a foreign student would expect. You're even making it easier for an Egyptian student coming from Heliopolis, not Heliopolis University, but Heliopolis district, um, to Ain Shams to find his way around the campus. The campus of Faculty of Engineering Ain Shams is quite complex. I got my, it took me a year when I first joined not to lose my way to my class. So for a student, uh, for a master's in a year in ancient to get lost in one year, which is a whole year, he's staying here, that's a lot. And getting all of that running, that's a very important thing to, uh, to do. It also comes with partnership. Uh, so in order for the program to be plausible and to be uh, um, attractive and actually to be sustainable, the partnership has to be very strong between the two uh, running universities, the two universities on both sides, uh, German and Egyptian side, and also to show that you have contacts, you have potential audience, you have potential users uh, of the quality of education that you're offering. Um, and um, it's not only that, but you have to continue widening your network. You have to continue, uh, in instead of not widening only your network, but more recently, we started to get receive requests from uh, NGOs um, like um, Basata. I think most of you know Basata. We've been contacted by Basata to conduct a workshop in Basata with the Bedouin to be able to, in, to root the uh, quality of tourism that they're trying to offer as ecotourism within the society of the Bedouins. They because they just came because they knew that there is a kind of education in that part where, uh, in the part of the university where you can get involved with society and you can make some change and so on and so forth. Um, that all comes with the bicultural programs. Um, it also got us as professors to change. I mean, and it's not only on the Egyptian side. Uh, I hope that my German partners will be here around, but I left them at the university. They should be following um, um, soon. but. It got us both to change. Uh, it got us both to, to look at the internationalization, to look at our students, at the kind of education that we're offering, and to act as catalyst for change within our own universities. And I'm not really exaggerating. Um, in Ain Shams, the bylaws of the IUSD, the master's that we founded, has been adopted by the Faculty of Engineering to be the role model for the postgraduate. And then when it was upgraded to the level of the university, the whole university changed their bylaws based on the bylaws of the ISD. So once you get something um, through and proven to be working and uh, with value, I don't think there is a great resistance to adapt something successful. But you have to put it forward and you have to make it possible and you have to make it um, accessible to others to use. And for that, I fully agree that it's not only about uh, a program within a campus. A program within a campus would be just a, a, an isolated island uh, that will never work. We have each and every program, each and every course, which should act as a catalyst, should act as a network agent within the agency and with others. Um, and I think um, from that perspective, 
the concept, the very basic concept of bicultural running a program between two universities, it has in itself the seeds and the values of cooperating and being transparent and being open to criticism and being uh, uh, progressive. It, it comes with it and it really, um, I would say, paved the road for lots of changes, not in the program, that's a very, very tiny change, but on a very, very big scale. Well, so that actually, that's a kind of program that's penetrating through the existing administrative structure and all the kind of structures inside the university, and it's planting its seeds. So uh, is this sort of a bottom-up approach that is coming through a program, or what exactly can you name it? I, I like that because of one analogy. Um, I, I, I usually, when it comes uh, to me from the dean or from the president, to, that we'd like to introduce that, I said it would not work. Not because you want it, it will happen. I have to make sure that I have the fertile soil for it. If I don't have, nothing will happen. And um, maybe an analogy with that with the student uh, initiatives when it comes to uh, um, the Go Green Campus. Um, we had a Go Green Campus initiative, a top-down one, supported by the president, by the vice presidents, by the deans, by blah, 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 by many professors. But it's not coming from the grassroots. So we had so many meetings, so many documents, so many presentations, and so many things. And actually, so many effort wasted. On the other hand, students, in isolation from us, they actually um, they did not go green, that they went even more academic than being green. Uh, they offered uh, training courses for newly appointed teachers to, to train them on how to deal with students when they are appointed. And I really got fascinated with the concept. So unlike what we used to training of professors or teachers by the top management officials and the university and the Supreme Council, now training to the newly appointed teachers is being offered by the students. So why not? And I really got that, you know, it's, and I think it's working, it's really working. Um, those who join the training courses are fascinated with what kind of easy to deal and, you know, easy routine things that will make their life much, much easier uh, dealing with students. And at the same time, bring, breaks that gap between a teacher and a student. Like, I'm a teacher, I know what's good for you, and I'm a student, I don't like what you're telling me. But it just breaks that, you know, tension between them. And I definitely don't believe at all in any top-down. It has to be um, bottom-up, it has to be grassroots, um, but then it must receive the needed top-down support. Without that, it dies immediately. Uh, so the clever thing is not only to continue grassroots, but to take it to the second level, and you have to do it this way. Otherwise, it would be just a group of enthusiast grassrooters uh, that will, with a good initiative that would die in a time of blah, blah, blah. Or it would be just a good idea from an uh, enlightened decision maker, but without any um, reasons for it to, su to survive. It actually has been a very fascinating exposure to the, to the contrast between the top-down and bottom-up approaches from the Egyptian and the German perspectives. Earlier, um, earlier and yesterday when we were speaking in an expert workshop, there were two different perspectives on one is the grassroots and the, uh, and the top-down approach from the German student perspective that I think will be really interesting to hear because of the different nature of centralization in the decision-making and administration between the two countries. So now, Johannes, it automatically comes to you. I really want to know your approach on change and what is the difference between grassroots and top-bottom from your perspective? How did it actually help you evolve? Um, yes, first of all, I would say when it comes to the, to the German side, it, it's important to understand that there are uh, two two basic things that are important for the, for the German science system or for the university, first of all. And, and the first thing is that, that you have an academic freedom, meaning that um, there isn't much chance of the ministry, even at the state or at the federal level in Germany, to influence 
wh how universities structure them themselves, what do they teach, on what do they do research on. So that's, that's a very big thing and it's written in our constitution. And the second thing is that, that universities are autonomous. So um, they have a, a, a strong self-governance self structure. So the university presidents, the deans and so on, they are elected um, by the university members itself. So they are not appointed by a ministry or so. One big issue then is of course the formal participation of students in Germany. There is space for improvement, no doubt about that. Um, but, but of course, like having all having these two things in mind, um, you cannot say you cannot have a top-down approach in Germany saying, "Dear university presidents, incorporate sustainability into teaching and research and your management, and then thi things go." So you have to do it in a different way. But when when I talk about bottom-up um, approaches, I would never say this is just student bottom-up thing. I, I, I would also say that if 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 employees, if professors are uh, just funding an initiative or funding a march, they they are they are they are also bottom up. And I think if we also think of of every participant of a university as as bottom up, then we also break with this hierarchical idea of well, there are the students below, and then there are PhD students and the professors and deans and the president and, and so on. So and that also leads me directly so uh, to the question what what brought success in, the, the, in my case or also in other cases of, of student groups that, that launched these bo bottom-up initiatives and one key figure always was cooperation. Not just saying, we as students, we have to fight and you know, the president, they, they, they hate us and, and they don't want to support us, but the key thing always, always was that, that of course you have people who are in favor of your project and there are other people who are skeptical or even rejected. But the key thing always is to, to identify the, uh, your partners, your potential partners that, that also, also share, share your minds, your values, and so on. And in doing so, in tubing, I think we had the, the, big, the big chance to yeah, bring several professors and also the chancellor and also and the president um, on our side. Um, yes, that's first of all. So in terms of yeah, bottom-up things. And just probably one thing, when it comes to other universities in Germany that are, I would say, in terms of the holistic approach, as you uh, pointed out, much further th than Tübingen, um, there the key actors were not the students, but were employees, were teaching staff, professors. They were the key driver that also took the chance when the university itself were in trouble or were close to be closed down because of low demand of their study programs, they said, okay, we have to, to do something new. We really have to start from the scratches. And they were, like, teaching stuff clearly were the key factors, the key drivers. So flowing inside that context and contracts, and the, I then go to Abdurrahman for the Egyptian student perspective. I would really like to know, how, is it, how are you engaging with your administration or with the higher level when it comes to education? Are you just doing student activities in exile? Or are you also contributing to some curriculum enhancements? Are you proposing or recommending any policies? How do you deal? This is my first question, and then I have another one for you. <laughs> well, to answer this question is it's, it's, it's very hard because uh, as we mentioned, as students, we, we don't have access to make uh, a huge change like uh, contributing in changing curricula and stuff like that. So uh, for sure we have tried before just to change little things like uh, we have problems in the registration system where students either uh, uh, f uh, freshmen or other students to sign up for their courses. Uh, in my university for instance, uh, Cairo University, it is pretty much hard to do that and, and there's always a technical problem that the website is not working and stuff like that. So we proposed with uh, as a very simple method to change this system uh, and not, it's not a system actually, but to, we offered a solution and actually it, they did not, they did, it wasn't incorporated. And uh, so I was talking about a very simple uh, thing that we needed to change, but it didn't change. So talking about a, a curriculum, it's pretty much hard. Uh, uh, I, the, no, the, there is no any change from our, our, our contribution didn't change anything uh, concerning this. So what we thought about is 
as long as the, the curriculum in, in, in our universities, or especially public universities, uh, is not providing all what we need to be prepared for the market afterwards after we, we graduate. So we thought about summer camp. That's a solution, actually, which is something that is parallel to the, not parallel to the education system, but also it's another, uh, yeah, we can say supplementary, yeah, something like that, something to provide what is missing in the university to the students yes. uh, through the summer camp. Uh, and actually, I, I wanted to, to uh, comment on, on something, the initiative that uh, you talked about, uh, I guess it's in Ain Shams University. That's a pretty much interesting uh, uh, initiative because it reflects a problem that we suffer from as students. It's not about that we don't like what the, st what the teachers or the, student, the, the TAs teach, it's about how they teach it. So I'm pretty sure that these workshops were about just communication skills. Because the, the em employment uh, at our public universities is solely based on the grades only. So they do not look into uh, the communication skills of uh, the students uh, that are uh, graduated with, with high grades. So all these problems we try as students, different activities and through the student union, to change, to uh, to tell the, the 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 university or the 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 one responsible for this who can make a change, uh, but all we all we find is is no change or very gradual, slow change, because I also know that professors and 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 in in the universities. They are also don't have access to make a change, so they have to go to the higher level till the minister, so he can sign the uh, the paper or whatever to make the change. So it's when we talk about the student level. Sorry, when we talk about the student level, it's uh, it's hard. It's hard. It's really hard to make a change specifically in the curriculum. That's great. Um, so I think we have concluded this round of questions and uh, for our esteemed audience if you have any questions our friend our colleagues will actually come uh, and pick the papers up and we now proceed with our final round of questions and then we go into the discussion um, for now I move to Dr. Sarheen and how we are now trying to look at the positives how can we incentivize the higher education system in Egypt in order to incorporate sustainable programs, sustainable degrees, a more sustainable way of education on campus when it comes to the, to the probably the curriculum, but not only the curriculum, the policy. You have earlier spoken about financial barriers and policy barriers. However, on the student German side, they said that from just reducing consumption, on energy and electricity, it has, it has actually managed to make a change. So what are the positives that you can see that can incentivize um, sustainability in higher education without this huge financial barrier? Well, I'm usually fast in answering, but your question is extremely multifaceted and quite difficult to answer. Um, let me start by saying um, that Financially, um, you don't need to incentivize uh, uh, public universities mm -hmm. to reduce their consumption of anything because they don't pay bills. Mm -hmm. So there is no way of incentivizing me if I don't pay anything to start with. Right. Okay, so uh, the first thing is to um, start billing public buildings for water, for energy, for electricity, and so on. You don't build them. So if you don't build them, why should they reduce anything? Mm -hmm. um, but please don't quote me beyond this room that I'm calling for billing the public <laughs> institutions just to answer your question, yeah. which might be out of context, but I will try to answer it <laughs> on a hypothetical level. Uh, so once you uh, started to um, introduce the cost that the beneficiary would feel that I need to reduce the cost. Then you start to incentivize. Yes. That's when it comes to the operational um, side of the campus. 
of being a green campus. That's on the operation of the campus, not on the program level, on introducing more uh, programs or introducing more uh, on uh, there are the sustainability of the campus, mm -hmm. programs on sustainable development, and sustainability of education. These are three different concepts that are all related to the term sustainability. Um, the first one, sustainability of the campus, you cannot really in introduce that without having to pay a cost to start with. So I think private universities, if they are um, uh, being built, I'm not sure, but maybe they are, uh, they feel uh, the pressure to incentivize themselves by reducing their, uh, their demand on whatever resources. Second, um, there are ways of that the government should introduce. For example, the real estate tax. If I say that Heliopolis University, they introduce solar energy, and by that they are reducing the demand on the grid of electricity, why shouldn't I introduce uh, or give them an incentive of giving them 20% off their real estate tax if they are paying real estate tax again? I'm, I'm not saying that they are paying, I'm not sure. But uh, this is a way of incentivizing um, the campus itself as a, as a building and its operation. When it comes to um, uh, promoting more uh, programs and more courses on sustainable development, I think this is tricky. It, it has to come from a national uh, perspective on um, uh, the strategic plan of the higher education, introducing more and so and national priorities, link that to job opportunities, link that to um, uh, jobs being offered, link that to building permits, link that to all on. It's a, it's a long uh, chain of changes that you need to introduce within the system that ultimately would get a professor or a department to say, mm -hmm, we need to introduce a, a program on that because if we don't introduce it, our graduate will not be able to work in companies and if he does not work in companies, we get much less students. But still, uh, departments in public universities, they are not competing on students. If they don't get students, they, because they don't get paid per student, by the way, so that's another factor. So you need also to introduce something related to uh, the attractiveness of the department. If the department is not attractive, I need to dilute it and cancel it. And that's something in the, uh, in the law of the universities that you need also to introduce, that you need to make an assessment of the performance of, and so on and so forth. So this is why I'm saying it's extremely multifaceted. Finally, when you, um, 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 the third component, which is sustainability of the education itself, uh, I think this is where um, the, the the management, the university management should play a role. Um, there should be an assessment of, um, uh, and, and I think the quality assurance thing, although I'm not a big fan of how it's being implemented right now, but it should uh, play a role in um, monitoring uh, how programs are sustainable when it comes to uh, content standard, um, 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 availability of staff linked to uh, society, uh, value added to the society and so on and so forth. So the track for that is mainly coming from the quality assurance um, track and the monitoring of the performance of these programs and the graduates and how they are linked to uh, society. So I hope that I tried to give you a simple answer, but I'm not sure if I managed to fulfill. Well, that was actually very, um, very, very um, indicative and descriptive. So I take this to the private university, uh, Heliopolis University. Uh, so how would you assess your own quality? Uh, is there some sort of, um, because, because you actually have specific programs that are improving uh, upon the needs of the society, as you have mentioned. Um, so how do you assess your quality? And also, what are the indicators that you measure against your degree of sustainability in higher education and degree of sustainability in performance? Well, let me start first uh, commenting on what Dr. Salhin was saying about uh, 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 the dimension of the green <laughs> curricula or the sustainable development curricula and greening the campus because the way, the way I see it, that they, they, if they go together, uh, that gives a proof in, 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 in implementation of the concept we teach to students. Uh, and regarding the sustainability, uh, it's a part of the, the running program that nevertheless, I said it's the market needs, yet it looks odd to high school graduates when they apply. Mm -hmm. 
uh, because they come up with the uh, with the inherited the family inherited concepts that what we need is to have like for example build do buildings or uh, be uh, work in international company and the same old concepts so introducing new concepts that are uh, not yet absorbed within our community is not an easy task. So if we go for a sustainable development or uh, um, renewable energy master or PhD program, it's much easier to, uh, um, to, to sustain that program rather than the undergraduate. So when, when you have intellectual students who have learned something, who has uh, matured enough to realize how the market goes, they can easily uh, choose their uh, postgraduate studies rather than the high school were raised on the traditional system of studying as much as you can, that capacity, and just put it in the exam, and then if you get 99, you're a doctor, if you get 95, you're an engineer, and if you get less than that, you go somewhere else. So this concept is not easy yet to, to, to be implemented, and and yet having sister companies, mothers, whatever we have, we still uh, see it not an easy task and we're against all odds with uh, setting uh, the sustainable development as the, the theme of Heliopolis University. Uh, and then comes back to your question of how sustainable we are. Um, um, we have a structure and we have a plan uh, every year we have to do this and do this and reduce our carbon <laughs> footprint. We have to reduce our energy consu consumption. We have to add to the governmental network with, uh, w w uh, with our excess energy we have. We have to farm some products within the campus. We have to recycle. We have to manage our waste. And, and every year we implement those those activities or rather the student projects and yet we suffer because yet we are still looking for the fundraising for such the the, the university is not a, 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 a non-profit university so it's, it's not funding these activities so yet we have to look for for funds to support this so it's normally if you look around there are social corporate responsibility that can add to that and yes, the, the, the main theme of most big companies, banks, and corporate side is environment, water, and energy. So we're kind of lucky to have support in that. And yes, they support to uh, invent something new or incorporate something that's simple that can conserve and preserve uh, what we have. But we need to report on how successful our experience was uh, whether to do a small business model, wh whether that can be implemented or not. It can be uh, 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 repeated on a bigger scale or stays on a s the, the, the demo scale that could be implemented in university or school. So this dynamic process is part of the uh, sustainable plan of the university to keep on going and, 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 and developing and report it on what we do. What we see as success story, we try to <coughs> expose as much as we can, and what we see is a failure story, we announce that to avoid in the coming. So every year, we're having a, a, a new initiative rather than just being educational, but, but being uh, implemented. So this year, we're studying different types of uh, renewable energy resources to uh, desalinate uh, water and use it uh, for aquaponics, which is a new <laughs> approach of having fish and, and plants together. So um, it's quite complicated, but but uh, we're we're trying to maximize the use of every drop of water and energy used, uh, so that we come up with promising solution that we can uh, say we can we have uh, uh, a startup and um, a source of income to fund something else that we uh, adapt. Um, thank you for this. And now my question goes to Johannes. 
Uh, Johannes, what were the key challenges that were actually facing you on the way to, to incorporate the sustainable thinking in your Greening in the University initiative? How did you manage to overcome them? And is there any similarity in the challenges between the Egyptian context and the German context from a student perspective? Well, I think there are a lot of similarities and I will come, come back to them. Um, I think one of the key challenges is, of course, as a student, you are supposed to uh, primarily study. And so that is also quite time consuming. Um, so being engaged aside from, the, from your normal studies uh, costs a lot of time. Plus you have this whole time component as a problem by now with a bachelor master degree with uh, students going abroad so that the time each and, and every student stay at a certain university is relatively short. So having these people all, uh, just for a short time within your group, it limits the, the capacity you really can have because if you probably are reaching out for a bigger program, it might probably take, take at least one year to, uh, to come up with a, with a proper concept. It take another year to uh, finally walk up through all the different committees and structures and person to really convince the, r the right uh, people. Um, and within the setting, it's, it might be difficult to really um, yeah, have that time. And I guess that's a similar problem here. Um, another problem was for us, probably for us it wasn't that complicated, but in general, I would say when it comes to student engagement for sustainable university, is the thing, uh, is a question of funding. Mm -hmm. How you get funding? Because if you talk to all the, the students group, you really figured out that if they really want to, want to start, out a, start out a, a project, they most of us spend one, one third of their whole time of managing the project just on getting funding. And I would say if you, you, know, if you could free this, this workload and better put that into, the, um, into your work, it, it would help you a lot. On the other side, um, also for us, for, for our sustainability program that we, that we put in place in Tübingen, in the beginning, we weren't, it wasn't that, that problematic to get funding because we had at that time tuition fees in place and they were just coming up. So there was a building up of money, so they had to give it, give it away. So we were in, uh, in the first year, we were able to get that money very easily. But in the, in the, in, in the, in the upcoming year, we were forced to, to apply for this, uh, for this money once a year. But this also helped us because we were forced to say, okay, what have we done during the last year? What courses? have we offered, what worked, what didn't work. So by, by doing so, by, 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 you know, we're by, by being forced in this kind of rigid uh, money funding system, which is typical to, to, to a university, probably not typical to students, and we were able to, to improve the, the quality of our study program. So that wasn't, wasn't that bad in the end. And of course, another thing is the um, hierarchical barriers that we have in Germany that are, that are in place here. Um, but I think it really depends on, on the person. So, you know, at, at certain university, there isn't like there is a hierarchical barrier uh, formally on the paper, but, but it's very easy for you to reach the president or a dean of a faculty. In other universities, it's very different. So I would say it's always, it's always possible to, to, uh, yeah, to overcome these barriers by identifying the right person. And then, you know, by having these contacts, then go to the decision makers. So yeah, I would say these are the, the key the key issues. Plus, plus probably one more thing, um, the whole the whole networking part, right? Because student groups and and the student is itself uh, engaging in these groups, they do that just for for very short time. So the the knowledge and skills management, transferring the skills and the knowledge from one student generation to the next, is quite complicated. So especially when you compare it to the to the university staff, which is in place for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so I think it's a, it's a very important. So if you really want to want to push student engagement, it's really important to to implement structures at each university that you know that that, that breach this gap. So that, that you have some kind of uh, cont uh, knowledge management structures in place that that help to transfer knowledge from one student generation to the next. That you have people at the university that that you could speak to that help you to to identify the right person, right? Because normally. You won't, you won't find everything in some written documents, but you just need to speak to a real person that can tell you who are the real other persons that you need to talk to. So I think there's a, there's a lot of, there are a lot of possibilities to really yeah, enhance student um, engagement. 
So I build on what you said and go to the Egyptian um, student perspective. So from you, you're, you're on the campus and you are active Youth in Green. Um, have you made any connections to other student activities that are working on different aspects of sustainability on the campus? You have spoken about your summer projects and summer camps and solar energy. What other aspects, um, what other aspects of sustainability can you see coming up from the student, from the student initiatives and organizations? And are you are actually connected together? Is there sort of a network? Are you working on something? Well, uh, <coughs> you think Green just started from uh, yeah, like two years ago in on campus, so we didn't ha well, not time, but actually we didn't uh, partner with other. Uh, uh, student activities so far, uh, but I would say that we like because student activities in, in in universities they they compete each other more than completing each other. Mm -hmm. So what we're trying to do, or we have a concept that we compete. No, sorry, we complete, not uh, competing. So definitely, we're looking forward for partnering with other uh, student initiatives on campus and off campus. I mean, like other campuses. Uh, in order to reach the, the, the bigger goal, which is promoting sustainability and, and teaching students what they miss, uh, what they have missed in, in on campus and and and, uh, and these uh, these stuff, uh, and actually I, I was really amazed uh, that uh, of the key challenges that Johannes just mentioned, because we really ha have these challenges as well. So I, I'll be echoing you if if I'm talking about the challenges. Probably we, we just have one more challenge, uh, which is uh, media exposure. Uh, the problem is uh, maybe in the I don't know if it's it's it's, in, it's logic or not, but the media, whenever we call them to cover something or uh, our summer camp to let us to let more people know and let more uh, either students or corporates to know about us so they can support us. So the the only question that they always ask us. Uh, Who's coming? Who is the VIP uh, coming to your event, or, or, or something like that? So, so I'm not generalizing for sure that all media uh, do this, but uh, this is something that we really suffer from, uh, and it's also on the other side, which is the VIPs or corporates uh, when we invite them. So, and again, I'm not generalizing this, but they also ask for whether there is media or not. So it's it's a cycle that, that we always go through, and and. So you have to have one bef to, in order to get the other one. Uh, so th that's um, a challenge. Uh, also, the other challenge is uh, our number. Uh, usually, student initiatives they have large uh, database. I mean, not databases to to market their uh, projects and stuff, but they have large uh, number of members that they work on the projects. But we we're just only around 18 students. And we started last year by 10 students, and we organize all these events. And, and uh, uh, so it's it's challenging because, like you said, uh, we are still students, and we are trying and striving to to maintain high grades, and at the same time uh, working professionally and, and to uh, to execute the camp or the all the the, the other uh, campaigns uh, professionally. So it's. It's it's pretty challenging, and uh, yeah, that's it. But uh, I would love to add something, or maybe it can be a question uh, afterwards. Uh, I might have sounded like uh, a little bit revolutionary when I talked about uh, uh, the 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 system or the education system or the decision makers. So for sure, there is a bright side, and uh, I would love to talk. Maybe if not now, maybe it would be a, a question later. But Okay, so I'll, I'll talk about the, the bright side. So it's not always dark. So uh, especially when it comes to the government, uh, for for instance, the Cairo University, uh, they supported us uh, through providing uh, professors uh, to give sessions to the students uh, in the camp. For sure, we, we choose certain professors that we know that they are experts in these fields and they know how to uh, deliver uh, the, the information uh, smoothly. Uh, also, Cairo University supported us uh, financially, though it's not that much uh, compared to other uh, corporates or compared to what we expect. Uh, but still, there is support, not as we expect, but we're hoping to get more support, at least 
something that is really simple uh, that we miss uh, on campus is some, uh, an office or a working space to work together or to have meetings. Uh, we, do, we don't have meeting, a meeting room for student initiatives. Uh, and this is actually a very nice attempt. So, I mean, this, the discussion here, so I know that there, there are uh, representatives from the government right now are sitting among us. So it's, it's talking about these things and to know uh, what we suffer from or, or the obstacles that we face is something that I think it's useful so you can uh, maybe uh, fix it later on uh, so we can be easier. So I'll talk about the government side, uh, uh, mentioning uh, the Ministry of Environment and the Ministry of Youth. Uh, the bright side of it is that there are many, many programs in each uh, uh, ministry about sustainability and uh, we're talking specifically about the Ministry of, of uh, the Environment. There is a specific office that is dedicated only to support student initiatives on campus. But here's the, here's the thing. Does anyone know anything about that program or that office? I doubt that no one, I think that no one knows anything about this office or it exists uh, uh, at the very first place. So uh, it's all about marketing these projects and these uh, offices so we can know uh, that, we, that, that there is a place to, to go in order to, uh, to ask for support or to have like partnership or something like that. So um, in the Ministry of, of, uh, uh, of Ministry of Youth last year, they hosted actually the, uh, the summer school uh, at their premises at, at Zamalek. Mm -hmm. uh, and this year, um, the, the Ministry of Environment, they provided us, uh, like uh, in the closing ceremony, they provided us uh, a conference hall so we can uh, execute the closing ceremony. So it's not that, it's not so dark. Mm -hmm. there, are, there, are, there is support. But we are expecting more. And we are expecting the government to reach out for students, and not only students to reach out for the government. Both of us have to work. Yeah. But Youth in Green, we always dig in order to find opportunities. That's why we know that there are offices like this at yes. the universities, at the, at the ministries. But uh, I, I believe that most of students, they know nothing about these offices or these programs that they exist uh, at, at, the minist at the ministries, yeah. So, thanks. Thanks. So definitely youth have to be more revolutionary than the, the, the other um, generations because this is what the youth spirit is all about. So you have to be happy about this and you have to ask for more definitely for improvement. Um, so now we go to the questions from the floor. And I have a question to you, Hannes. So we, we go for, the, for these questions. We answer briefly and comprehensively, but because we are a little bit short on time, so, Johannes, you said Germany is behind when it becomes to sustainable development education. Um, which country you think is on top of education for sustainable development? Ooh, this is a very good question. Um, I would not say that I have all the knowledge to answer this question in a proper way. And I think probably it's also not even possible to do so when it comes to the university system. I think you will probably find in every year, in every country um, very decent universities that, that have implemented a very holistic approach to, in, to incorporate sustainable development. So they really have to uh, bring it into operations, management, teaching and research. Um, for example, if you, if you look at, um, at this whole thing about management structures and responsibilities and assessment tools, I would say there is a case to make for us at least some, some American universities and university from the Scandinavian uh, countries because in these, in these countries, um, sustainability indicators for university do play a certain role by now. Um, so I think, in, and especially as all these responsibility management issue is key when it comes to incorporate sustainable, uh, sustainability in, into the university, I think they are yeah, some kind of a a role model in terms of getting these structures right. Yeah. And now my question is for, uh, or the question from the floor actually, is for Dr. Sarheen now. Um, the question is actually asking if there's any alumni tracking system uh, for the graduates of the Egyptian universities. Do you have a clue? <laughs> No, the, the answer is simple. There is no easy tracking even of current students, let alone tracking the alumni. So, um, 
Uh, no, for sure. In Shams University and Cairo University, we're around 200,000 uh, students. Mm -hmm. So tracking the current ones is quite difficult, let alone tracking the previous ones. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure if that helps in answering the question, but um, of course there are some um, self-organized initiatives, like um, the union of the graduates of that department. And that's, it's not like uh, initiated by the university, but it's again uh, initiated by the graduates who would just initiate that union and then maybe they seek uh, location within the university and the university would usually uh, allow them place within the campus, um, and, but not organized by the institution. The institution itself is quite busy trying to get things running. <laughs> so there is no escape because I have the other question for you as well. Um, so the question says that discussions on sustainability, on sustainable development, on sustaining our environment are going on every day. In a way or another, they are definitely connected in the end. But are there any coordinated effort or connections between the efforts that are going on? Um, I think that, that brings me to um, a very simple fact. Sustainability is not something that you teach at the university or, or uh, at any educational uh, institution. It's kind of a society culture. It's a, either they have the culture or we have the culture or we don't have it. Um, in August, I was in Germany trying to book a um, room in near Lake Constance. And um, among the options uh, offered, there was one of the hotels um, with a rate, and then they were offering um, green initiative discount, 10% if you arrive by train. Just show your train ticket at the reception, and then you get your 10% off. Um, I'm not sure how far that can be implemented here, because once um, there was two conflicting messages coming from the government. One, uh, we need to up, uh, implement real estate tax because um, um, that's everywhere and we need to pay for municipal costs and so on and so forth. And at the same time, places like Zamalek, like downtown, they were extremely suffering and suffocating from lack of uh, parking places. Uh, and I put a proposal to them, um, to um, a decision maker, uh, um, to uh, kind of subsidize um, the buildings in the Malik or these uh, really high uh, maintenance buildings um, uh, and areas to subsidize them from a percent of the real estate tax if they made their garages open or public or even they opened the shops and whatever. And immediately he said, mm, but that's the business of the Minister of Environment, it's not my business. So. Coordinated efforts is not automatically uh, there, and you need to have the culture uh, running. You need to um, introduce that if you're a minister of finance and you're not subsidizing that, you will pay much more in fuel, in cars, touring around, trying to find parking spot, because you're subsidizing fuel, and you're paying billions uh, of Egyptian pounds in subsidizing fuel, in cars just going around around trying to find a parking spot. And you can easily s save that uh, much more if you kind of introduce a subsidy. So it's kind of a, uh, a culture that you need to introduce. I have to say, it, it's starting to appear. Uh, for example, there is now um, an attempt from the Ministry of Planning and we're trying to help them with that is to uh, promote cycling and to introduce uh, cycling dedicated lanes and cycling dedicated network. Uh, and uh, the whole concept of the project is calculated based what, how much would it cost us, how much would it save. From the Ministry of Planning, that's fair enough because if we, inv uh, if we uh, um, um, invested in this infrastructure, it would cost us a capital now, but it will save on the long term much more. And I think that's in my opinion, that's a change in paradigm. That was not there maybe four or five years ago. So now we are done with the discussion and we are now seeking some closing remarks. So uh, I'll just ask some questions and uh, I would really love to know what you think of them, quite brief, and that's paving the way for the future. So my first question goes to Dr. Rasha. Um, is there any proposal or a plan or existing 
cooperation between Heliopolis University and any public university where you can do some knowledge sharing or experience sharing um, between your methods of uh, learning and education and the public university one? Or is there some, something as a toolkit, for example? Many, many cooperation programs with public universities, like I said, in projects like uh, Cairo University, uh, uh, Aziz University, Alexandria University, um, and, and, and this goes from uh, sustainable development educational <coughs> programs to implemented pilot projects uh, that could be uh, uh, models for uh, uh, saving the resources in a very a uh, simple way and, and not a costly way. But there are also uh, initiatives in cooperation with the governmental organizations like, uh, if I mention one, it's called the EduCamp projects, which is directed to uh, primary and schools or normally students from age, uh, uh, from fifth grade primary to uh, first preparatory year, so mainly from nine to 14. And it's adding the sustainable development dimension within the existing curricula. So if they're talking about resources, we do exercises beyond the uh, educational book that they sense how uh, we waste water, how we use cons consume water, the content of water in our bodies, how important that is, uh, issues like water scarcity, um, uh, uh, ground pollution, and all this is incorporated, and I believe the Ministry of Education is incorporating the EduCamp uh, toolkits within the educational system. And that was the driving force, like I said yesterday, about the child university. And that was uh, uh, 23 uh, public universities contributed to their projects based on the toolkits that were introduced in the EduCamp with different concepts like renewable energy, uh, 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 water filtration and uh, wastewater management, uh, uh, um, uh, managing projects and, and, and budget breakdown, stuff like this for uh, the business school to introduce and the um, biodiversity uh, issues. So having 23 uh, public universities uh, cooperating uh, with uh, uh, Heliopolis University in that initiative and training of the teaching assistants how to train uh, the, the, the young kids on, 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 on the uh, sustainable development dimension is a big move. And, and, and not to stop on just um, educational programs, but into implemented programs and to have implemented research within ministries, like we have many initiatives with the uh, Ministry of Environment, uh, -E -A -A, uh, and, and, and Ministry of Water Resources and Irrigation, and Ministry of Agriculture. So um, um, yes, there are initiatives, and yes, they are willing to uh, cooperate. And, and, and if we don't reach for these governmental institutions, we'll stay in our isolated island uh, trying to introduce an, a new approach that it's not yet digested within the community. Thank you. Um, remarks from Dr. Salheen. So within this chaos of where to start and all of the interconnections, if you as an expert are to name a one, two, three, four key priority areas that we should start with in order to make our education more sustainable, what can you name? Um, I think um, I would pick on two comments from the student representatives. Cooperation, I think this is a key point it's mainly cooperation, cooperation. And I would pick on the other point of competition. Because I think it, we, you should start from the balance between the cooperation and the competition. Universities do cooperate and do compete. Uh, it's not only in Egypt, it's also in Germany, in the States, and everywhere. We all cooperate and we all compete. Um, it's only where you find the balance between cooperation and competing where you get um, a sustainable system running, because there you can only get to an, a balanced ecosystem 
of educational system. Because in ecosystem, you have a competition, and you have cooperation, you have um, agents within the system that helps and complement and supplement each other and also compete because if you don't compete, it, you will just die. Uh, competition is mainly about being better and being uh, forward and enhancing what you have. And I think um, reaching that point of being able to um, um, balancing between our need to compete to be better and our need to cooperate to be bigger, uh, this is where you should start. And it starts at, at any level. It starts at the level of a student, at a professor, at a university, at ministry, it starts at any level. Just you need to get the balance between these two. If you stop at any one of them, you're just not gonna reach sustainability by any sense, I think. To Johannes now. So how can you motivate your Egyptian counterpart to unleash his potential and his group's potential, all the students' and youth potential, into making their, university and, uh, their universities and campus more sustainable? Um, I wouldn't say that I have to, to motivate uh, someone, at least not the students, uh, to unleash their their potential, I think especially when you when you tell the numbers from your last last summer camp, right? Over a hundred thousand uh, people applying for such a summer camp, by and then you were just able to choose forty or so, right? So I think this just this very specific figure shows there's a huge demand of of students that that say sustainability is important, and I want to be part of transforming our society, our um, economy. Um, so I think when it comes to, to unleash the potential, and I think there is much more potential, especially if you look just at the pure numbers. So of course, not every student is totally committed to sustainability and wants to act and wants to do all this glorious thing we are talking here about. But if you look just at the pure numbers, you also don't need everyone to become the big change agent, right? You don't need that, and you won't have that in any society. So I think it's just key to get all or to, to be able to provide all the motivated uh, students and all motivated uh, teaching staff and professors and so on to give them the chances. So what could be done? So I probably want to say, well, now from a German perspective, but I think also from the discussion now, I would say there are, there are huge similarities between both uh, systems. So I would say first thing, of course, is to, yeah, to probably make structures not that hierarchical anymore and uh, yeah and in a sense of uh, thinking of we are part of one university and some are currently students and some is just the president so and yeah be able to yeah especially from the student perspective be more open to uh, to the opinions to the the proposals to the idea of students even though they are probably not yet elaborated and fancy and, 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 and all that stuff just because students are probably just 20, 25 years old. And, and of course, um, I think a key thing is what you also said with, the, with, with all the time constraints students have when they do all this, all this engagement aside from their study. I think, and there's also the key potential for universities, if they really link operations and teaching and research and if they put all these th things together, so seeing their own university as as an object or as a subject of transformation and so that, that you don't have to to become an uh, to, to become engaged by well, okay now i just finished my 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 studying at eight o'clock so i now do half an hour but no it should be part of what you're doing at the university it should be a, be an essential part and by putting it into your study study programs you you already line out that it is important and that it shouldn't be just something you could do aside, but it's, it's essential that if you want to study, of course you should also not just learn and learn in a theoretical way, but also learn to act and to, to do really um, change things. And yeah, and another thing is for all these pioneer students, stuff and so ever, I think there should be more, uh, more seed money because with just in many cases, also just with very little, little funding and with, uh, yeah, l not too much uh, bureaucratic uh, limits and barriers, you could just unleash a lot of new ideas and probably a lot of projects won't work in the beginning, but still there are huge learning effects. So I think there should be more, much, much more seed money uh, going into this, the, the fear and the talk there also for, for Germany, of course, there's room for improvement. 
So for Abdurrahman, let me do a temperature check. Um, how do you picture um, your university in 10 years from now? <laughs> well, uh, that's also a hard question because uh, especially here in Egypt, it's, uh, it's Everything is not stable right now. Uh, I mean, uh, like today or yesterday, we had uh, like uh, ministers and stuff, and then the day after, there was no government. You know what I mean? So everything changes a lot, and and so you cannot predict what will happen even in three years or or four, excuse me, or five years. So ten years, I would say, hopefully, uh, I picture my university to be one of the leading universities not only in Egypt, but also in the Middle East and, and in, in Africa, and, and it be uh, competing and cooperating with uh, the, the top leading universities all over the world, hopefully. Uh, but to be honest, I cannot predict uh, if, that will be, if that will be the case or not. So hopefully it will be. This is very beautiful hopes and valid um, concerns that you have actually addressed. Um, I would love to thank my panelists for this evening. It has been very interesting to have you here. The discussions were just great. I hope they were very interest interesting for the esteemed audience that we have. Uh, we have now concluded the 32nd round of the Cairo Climate Talks. I hope you have enjoyed it. I now invite you all for a dinner outside and um, have a nice dinner. So, so, uh, yeah,